When I ask people if they know what contents tourism is, most people say they don't know. However, when I give them some examples of what contents tourism is, they say, oh yes, I've done that. So, before I give you any explanations, here are some examples. Here is the Bruce Lee statue in the Avenue of Stars, Hong Kong. In this park there are various plaques, statues and murals celebrating the Hong Kong film industry. I took this photo in 2017. Note the fan copying the pose in the statue. Next is the Wizarding World of Harry Potter attraction at Universal Studios Japan. People are taking photos and selfies in front of the Hogwarts Express. The next example is the Hyper Japan event held in my hometown London. This is the end of the cosplay competition in 2015 when all the competitors gathered on stage for a group photo. People came from all over the country to take part and the winner got a ticket to the World Cosplay Summit held in Japan. Finally, here's me, looking a little younger than I do now. I'm in a Shinsengumi costume at the Ryozen Museum of History in Kyoto. This is a place where lots of history fans go to learn more about the Bakumatsu period and Meiji Restoration in the mid-19th century. So what connects all of these different kinds of tourism experience? The answer is contents tourism, which may be defined as follows. Travel behaviour motivated fully or partially by narratives, characters, locations and other creative elements of popular culture forms including film, television dramas, manga, anime, novels and computer games. Actually, there are various kinds of terms used to describe this kind of tourism. However, if we think of the example of Harry Potter fans visiting Universal Studios Japan, we begin to see the advantages of the contents tourism approach. We might think of this as film tourism or film-induced tourism. After all, the appearance of the theme park is heavily based on the Harry Potter films. But we might also call it literary tourism because the Harry Potter boom really came out of the best-selling series of children's novels by J.K. Rowling. This phenomenon of books and films working together to create fandoms and travels by fans is widely recognised. In their 2017 book, Sheila Agarwal and Gareth Shaw recognised the limitations of single category terms like film tourism and literary tourism and they partially resolve the issue by joining them together. They analyse examples like Harry Potter under the category heritage, screen and literary tourism. They add heritage tourism because much tourism relating to works such as Harry Potter takes place at historical sites like castles. But even this term is restrictive, particularly if we work in a Japanese context where anime, manga, light novels and games are all part of the media mix too. And while Harry Potter fans visit various heritage sites, we could not say that visiting a theme park such as Universal Studios Japan is heritage tourism. Another common term in English is media tourism, but this is very broad. It also covers tourism induced by advertising, television news, documentaries, social media and other media products. In contents tourism, we are focusing on creative works of entertainment which do not set out to induce tourism, but do so nevertheless. So, none of these common terms in English really capture what's going on at Universal Studios Japan. What is happening is that a narrative world has been created by multiple works in multiple media formats. The contents of this narrative world induce fans to travel to related sites. This is why we call it contents tourism. This is not to say that the English-speaking world has completely missed these issues of multimedia dissemination. In English language media scholarship, a parallel discussion to contents emerged with Henry Jenkins' discussion of convergence culture. Quote, By convergence, I mean the flow of content across multiple media platforms the cooperation between multiple media industries and the migratory behaviour of media audiences 
who would go almost anywhere in search of the kinds of entertainment experiences they wanted. End quote. Note Jenkins' use of the word content. Japanese scholars just went straight to the heart of the matter by adopting the English word content into Japanese as the loan word contents. This then became contents tsurism, which was introduced back into English language scholarship as the term contents tsurism in 2013. Note also how Jenkins' analysis is working in media and cultural studies, not tourism studies. He does not talk about tourism, and tourism scholars writing in English do not talk about convergence tourism. But contents tourism is effectively travel-induced by works in which there is what Jenkins calls convergence. So be aware of this other term in English. When we say contents, many others are talking about convergence. I said just a moment ago that the term contents tourism was introduced in English in 2013. This is the year when the first article using the term was published by our research group. However, the phenomenon of contents tourism has existed in Japan since well before 2013. Much of the early research was based in anime tourism studies. Anime tourism remains an important sub-theme within contents tourism studies. Anime tourism is also used as part of national government strategy for inviting international tourists to Japan. The Anime Tourism 88 website, for example, makes an explicit link between anime tourism and the Henro pilgrimage to 88 sites in Shikoku. An actual place where you can see this strategy in action is the Narita Anime Road in Narita Airport, one of Tokyo's two main international airports. In 2022, when I took this photo, it contained an exhibition about the Anime Tourism 88 sites, was selling many anime goods, and had pamphlets introducing sacred site anime pilgrimage in many different languages. This exhibition is clearly aimed at inbound tourists. In Japan, the two key years for contents tourism policy are 2005 and 2012. In 2005, a policy document titled Investigative Report into Regional Revitalization by the Production and Use of Content Such as Film recommended that local authorities should utilize local contents as part of their strategies for attracting tourists and for local revitalization. This was when the government officially started promoting domestic contents tourism. Then in 2012, the Cool Japan Initiative, Midterm Report, extended the strategy to inbound tourism. Originally, the Cool Japan strategy was about selling more cultural products to international markets. Note how the diagram on the slide, which was produced by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI, sees the sale of Japanese pop culture content to foreign consumers as a means of attracting inbound tourists to Japan. So we've had a short introduction to what contents tourism is and how it became part of Japanese tourism policy. But how do we actually do contents tourism research? In contents tourism research, we examine the behaviours of and relationships between three main actors, fans, contents businesses and local authorities. The fans are the people who travel. The contents businesses are the individuals or companies that produce the contents. And the local authorities are the municipalities who welcome tourists to sites within their jurisdiction. At a basic level, all three actors are seeking a successful contents tourism experience. But what does that mean? Well, I think that in this instance we can define success very simply as something that persuades an actor to keep repeating their current practices. It worked well, so we will continue doing it. For fans, success is mainly experiential. The tourism is deeply meaningful to them. It enhances their sense of being a fan of the contents. For the casual tourist, just being enjoyable is probably enough. But regardless of how serious they are as fans, travellers want to enjoy their trip. For contents businesses, the key is commercial success. 
Their main aim is to sell their own work, not to induce tourism. However, if the tourism generates additional sales, profits via tourism, and other benefits such as increased fan loyalty, then they will be happy to get involved in any tourism activities too. For local authorities, the key word is sustainability. The tourism induced by works of popular culture should not harm the local environment or make a community an unpleasant place to live. In the ideal, in addition to clear financial and other benefits, the community should feel a strong attachment towards the contents. If we put all of these ideas together, we can create the diagram on the slide. The circles represent success for each individual actor. The ideal target to aim for is in the middle, where all three actors feel they're gaining something positive from contents tourism. One of the key conclusions of our research over the past 10 years or so is that when the actors create a positive, collaborative relationship, the benefits of contents tourism are maximised. I've also developed a slightly more complex version of this model that takes into account the environmental impacts of tourism. The environmental crisis and global warming are serious issues for the tourism industry. You can read more about this in the conclusions to our 2020 book, Contents Tourism and Pop Culture Fandom. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to learn more about Contents Tourism, please do check out the other videos on the website of the Centre for Advanced Tourism Studies at Hokkaido University, or check out my YouTube channel, or read our various publications, many of which are open access online.